All right. So I'm letting everyone kind of come into the Zoom room. And as you arrive, uh, we'll get ready with our speaker and our tour here today. Uh, but very happy to welcome you to the Art Museum of West Virginia University's first public program of the 2020-2021 academic year. My name is Heather Harris and I am the museum's educational program manager and I am very thrilled that we have this opportunity to get a look at personal to political celebrating the African American artists of the Paulson Fontaine Press which opened a couple weeks ago here in our galleries. I would like to remind all of you who are able that we are open to the public on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays from 12.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. And you need to go to the museum's website to book a ticket. We would still encourage all of you who can to come see this exhibition in person. But one of the happy uh, accidents of having to function in this way is that we actually can welcome people who maybe be, might be further afield. And for those of you who are joining us from outside of Morgantown today, we're so glad that you'll be able to experience this exhibition with us. Um, our speakers today are our museum's curator, Robert Bridges, who is going to take us through the uh, exhibition. And um, Professor Joe Lupo, who is the coordinator of the printmaking program here at West Virginia University in the School of Art and Design. So we're very happy to have the two of them. And before I turn it over to Bob, just a few notes. First off, we are offering live captioning today. So if that is a service that you want to avail yourself of, you can just press the little CC button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, throughout the program, I will be moderating the Q&A. Uh, we will likely uh, not interrupt Bob or Joe unless there's something enormously pressing, but I will kind of collect all of those and we'll have some time for questions at the end. So please, if something pops to your mind throughout, uh, send those our way and we'll be happy to engage in dialogue with you. So now, without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Bob. Bob, you need to unmute. Now, can everyone hear me? I hope so. I will go back over that. Much better, Bob, uh, am, thank you. Okay, great. I'm here to uh, lead you through the exhibition and I'm going to act as not only tour guide, but also as cameraman today. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, have the opportunity to share this exhibition with you. But as Heather stated, um, I, I really highly encourage you to, if you can, come into the gallery, make an appointment to get in and see this exhibition. It really has to be seen in person. Um, but I will take you through, give you an idea of what it looks like, uh, and talk a little bit about the artists and uh, who's included in the exhibition, as well as um, at the end of our tour, uh, Joe and I will talk a little bit about one of the artists, kind of more like our normal lunchtime books. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to get on the other side of the camera and lead you on our tour. I'll try to do this as slowly and smoothly as possible so um, I don't make you all seasick. But this is a, a look at uh, the exhibition and how it's laid out. This is um, 53 works in the gallery. Uh, by 14 different uh, African-American artists who have 
worked at uh, Paulson Fontaine Press in uh, San Francisco. They have uh, created 44 prints and between the years 2000 and 2017. Uh, those are the prints that are here in the exhibition. Uh, the Paulson Fontaine Press specializes in intaglio uh, printmaking. So you're going to be seeing all intaglio prints today, not uh, woodcuts or lithographs. And then there is also, as you can see on the end wall, some additional um, work uh, like prints and sculpture and paintings included. There's um, uh, also by individual artists who have prints in here as well. Uh, Pam Paulson is the master uh, printer at Paulson Fontaine. And a master printer is really an, an artist who is uh, an expert in her field of, uh, in, in this case, intaglio printmaking. And Pam collaborates with artists, uh, invited artists to sort of uh, extend or enhance the artist's vision in the print form. These artists may not have any experience whatsoever in printmaking and will uh, come in and then through Pam's assistance and the discussions with her and the artists, the, um, the artists will, and will come up with a plan to create uh, 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 an addition of prints. Uh, the, the press opened in uh, 1997 and Pam has created 600 editions um, since that date. Uh, the 14 artists here have very different visions and styles and messages. So I'll start off kind of and take you through each artist and just mention a little bit about each one so we can uh, uh, see all 14 artists before we're finished here. First artist is a um, artist by the name of Gary Simmons. And, and Gary's work, uh, he's known for some of his paintings, but he's very interested in, in memory. And uh, he calls these particular pieces erasures. And so you can see in this that it almost looks like a chalkboard. Uh, there's a chandelier image and there's uh, a feeling that it's started to be erased and it's kind of slipping through your mind uh, away from into your memory. And then some of his other prints here, uh, uh, this piece is, um, you can see Starlight Theater. It looks like the facade of a drive-in movie also starts to um, be erased. But, but in this piece, because it's a theater, I think I start seeing the flickering of a film projector. And with the addition of the bright orange color, it almost appears to be on fire as well. So I'll get a little closer to this so you can kind of see some of the detail in there. The next artist uh, is an artist by the name of Radcliffe Bailey. He is from Atlanta, Georgia, and he's interested in, uh, he's, he's exploring African-American history as well as memory. Uh, he works with a grid pattern as, whoops, as well as um, uh, photographs in these works. And he builds up the images with layers upon layers, uh, the, the, all of the uh, colors being different plates built up. And then these uh, photographs are generally um, from his family collection. This is an image of the Mississippi River in this one. And 
as we go slowly as possible. This is actually an image of his grandfather's tobacco farm. So the artist um, is recalling these uh, this, through layers of information, uh, is interested in the, the memory, the history of his family, as well as the uh, history of American, uh, African Americans in uh, this country. Some more pieces. Next artist is Lava Thomas. We'll try to get as close to these. These are just straight intaglio. Uh, black and white intaglio drawings, so you can really see some of the uh, fine detail and drawing work within there. Uh, Lava Thomas is an LA artist and she works in the intersection of feminism and uh, African American protest work. Um, these are, she calls these fictional self portraits. And then the other piece, it's really a tour de force piece here. Let's get some, okay. Uh, those are all uh, tambourines and they're uh, painted in, painted or uh, different colored vinyl. There's some reflective plastic material as well as um, a little glass addition on these tambourines. Um, you can see there's also some text on there. It's very hard to read uh, from the camera. This piece is entitled, A Change is Gonna Come. Oh, yes, it will. Uh, the tambourines and pyrogenic calligraphy on metallic leather suede reflective plexiglass. Uh, and lamp work glass. I will try to keep moving. We have a lot of artists to get through here. And Bob, Next. I said that I wasn't, yes. I wasn't going to interrupt you with questions. But I'm going to ask this one since it's so fundamental okay. to what you're talking about. And um, we mm -hmm. had someone ask you to um, define intaglio. And I oh was boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can also unmute Joe yes. if you prefer. No, no, I can certainly do that. I just uh, hadn't, hadn't thought about uh, the very basics of what I'm talking about. Cer certainly. Um, intaglio printmaking uh, that is a, a form of printmaking in which the artists are using uh, copper plates, so a metal plate, and the work is incised into the plate itself. Okay, so uh, engraving is part of this tradition, etching is part of this tradition, and um, in this case, these artists are uh, using all kinds of techniques with Pam Paulson's uh, assistance, uh, and we were gonna talk a, a little bit about some of these techniques, like soft ground here, um, MacArthur Binion's work, he's actually um, able to use uh, photographic images um, and using something called an aqua tint, uh, which is um, a technique in which you uh, create uh, levels of gray within your um, the intaglio plate. These intaglio plates are usually put into acid baths in order to etch the plate, which creates a surface in which ink will stick into them. And once the ink sticks within the plate, it can be run through the, a press and then transferred to a sheet of paper. Okay, um, so a lot of these uh, techniques are um, 
sort of difficult concepts, but just so you uh, know or, or help you understand it is that every thing you're seeing has to be somehow uh, cut into the plate in order to hold ink. And generally speaking, each color uh, holds, or each uh, color has to be on a different plate in order to build these. So sometimes uh, in some of these, you'll be seeing lots and lots of colors. Just know that those were various plates uh, being used, not all done on the same plate. So MacArthur Binion is from Chicago. He comes from a tradition of uh, abstraction and minimalism, yet he uh, uses personal images uh, based on uh, his own likeness in some cases. He uses personal imagery uh, as well as personal information to create his work. Uh, and once again, you're seeing sort of the grid pattern uh, within here, very similar to um, uh, quilting and uh, as well as modernism and modernist painting that he's interested in. Here in the background, you start to see the rep repetitive uh, self-portrait in there, not just my reflection, hopefully. So even though you can see this is a basically red piece, those are very different, um, different plates and different color runs. Pam Paulson is really masterful in um, being able to create uh, uh, lots of texture and value and use of color uh, within her prints. The next artist is Carrie James Marshall, another Chicago artist. Um, his goal in, in uh, creating artwork is really to, to uh, reclaim art history using the African-American figure, the black figure within the artwork. And he, he states that he uh, grew up seeing art and art history and not seeing himself represented in any of that. So uh, this piece, which is entitled Vignette Wishing Well, is from 2010. And he's basing this on French Rococo, uh, and specifically Fragonard's uh, The Swing. And you can see the wishing well, she's tossing a coin over her shoulder and the, the flowers and the kind of clouds you're looking through into the scene and these bubble hearts floating all around. So really intricate, drawn as well as etched print. Okay, the next artist is by the name of Lonnie Holly. He is from Georgia. Lonnie is a self, or I'm sorry, from uh, Alabama. He's a self-taught artist and he's really known for his uh, uh, found object sculptures and uh, in his prints, and I'll swing around and look at his prints, he uses those found objects and in, a, in something called a soft ground. And a soft ground is when a um, soft wax-like material is put on the surface of the intaglio plate and then the material is able to be pressed into the plate and then that texture is able to be etched into the plate. So you can see the reference to these found objects as well as creating the, the visual of a ship on an ocean with uh, clouds above. 
Uh, one of the other things I have to mention, Lonnie is also a musician, and you really owe it to yourself to go out and uh, uh, find uh, some of his music. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing stuff. The next group of artists actually are the G's Bend Quilters from G's Bend, um, Alabama. They are Mary Lee Bendoff, uh, Louis, uh, Louisiana Bendoff, Loretta Bennett, and Loretta Petaway. These, these artists are known for the quilting tradition within their community. And that tradition was started in the 1920s. And uh, they're really always use uh, recycled uh, clothing and materials rather than store bought. They don't work off panels. It's more of an improvisation. And so uh, Pam uh, was able to uh, contact these artists and talk them into coming to the press to make some prints. And so here you see the actual quilts on the wall, but here are prints of the quilt. And from what I can understand about this process is once again, they used the soft ground, in which case they took some of their quilt piece work and uh, impressed it through the press into the plate. And so they were able to, once again, you're gonna use a, a different color plate for every color or different plate for every color you're using. And so I'll try to get close here. So you can see the seams, you can see the texture of the fabric. And in fact, the blue and white there, you can tell the original uh, was a jean material, blue jeans. Just really um, amazing work. And the reason I say that, that, um, that they, they worked from these peacemaking quilts, piece, quilt, pieced quilts, is that uh, there's an image of them working in the studio where they have their sewing machines. So they actually put these together in the printmaking studio and then uh, made the prints from what they had already sewn. Next artist is um, artist, uh, LA artist by the name of Edgar Arsenault. And his work, these four pieces, are all based on his uh, history and interest in the Watts neighborhood in LA. And I'll get close to one of these. And you can see the Newsweek um, uh, magazine cover on the front and they're talking about the 1966 uh, LA riots. There's another one here. And I'll get close to this one. And what the artist is doing here is, if you can see in the, the center, it's kind of his visual representation of the Watts Towers there. And then around it are these different perspectives of some of the buildings in the neighborhood, the Watts neighborhood. And uh, they are viewed from below. And then as it turns around, eventually they're viewed from above. It, it turns on it, in on itself and um, relates to um, sort of a, giving a different perspective as well as sort of the turmoil within that, that neighborhood. Next artist is Samuel Levi Jones, who is an Indiana artist. And early in his career, he was a photographer, but he became more and more interested in working with uh, material. 
And in these prints, he's actually working with book covers, uh, recycled books, and uh, he uses them as kind of a reference to uh, symbols of knowledge. And I really, um, uh, I think we're quite fortunate to have this work and be able to talk about this in this time period. Um, uh, because his interests uh, lie in this, the symbols of knowledge. So the way he created this particular piece is he took those book covers and inner jacket papers and he dipped them in tar and then ran them through the press and the tar would act as a resist so they could create these uh, aqua tint uh, variations and colors in this quilt like pattern. But one of, I'll show you the other one here, this quote that I, I just have to read because it's so fitting for uh, our news today. He says, in an era where facts and truths are disputed, who select, select the facts being presented? And uh, if you've been listening to the news this week and talking about textbooks and uh, the rewriting of textbooks or um, this idea of American in the textbook, well, who's America, right? The next artist is, um, probably the most well-known artist in this uh, exhibition. This is Martin Purrier. Martin Purrier is known as a sculptor primarily. He works in many materials, but he started out really uh, in uh, wood working. Uh, you can tell by these prints that he's very interested in form even though these are two-dimensional pieces, uh, they reference his sculpture, and he builds these images up from on the plate. So these are all hand-drawn. You can see some of the, the plate tone and um, kind of the markings within the plate. One of the things that you can't see on the video camera is uh, the hand quality of, of him making marks to build up this black. It would have been easy to do that uh, with a printmaking technique of an aqua tint, but uh, Purrier was very interested in the hand uh, drawn image. He's very interested in everything being hand built. And here he's used uh, a marking uh, 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 object, a marking pen to uh, build up this, the marks to create this black, even though at this point it's hard to tell that that's uh, just little tiny marks that have been built up one on top of each other. And then the last artist we're going to talk about is an artist by the name of David Huffman. He's from Berkeley, California. And uh, I will ask Joe to join me now to, <laughs> to discuss this artist a little bit more fully. Uh, thanks, Bob. Sure. Hi, Joe. Um, Yes, um, so go ahead and, and uh, tell us uh, a little bit about David Huffman mm -hmm. um, from your perspective as a printmaker. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that looking at uh, David Huffman's work, um, you know, especially the prints that we're going to see here, which have a lot of conflicting imagery um, and I think some surreal and con kind of confusing imagery. I think it's worth noting a couple things about his background and then taking a look at, you know, the way that these were made and then thinking about the processes in which they're made. Right, so like Bob said, you know, David Huffman is from Berkeley. Um, 
And his mom was an activist in the 60s. Um, she worked with the Black Panther movement. Uh, and Huffman talks about, you know, holding uh, his first picket sign when he was five. So he's no stranger to trying to say something socially relevant uh, in his work. Um, the other thing about, about Huffman that I, I think is, is worth noting is that uh, he's really uh, open about his interest in science fiction, which we can see in, in the work that he's making. Um, you know, he really liked, you know, Star Trek, you know, for example. Um, one of the stories that he tells is uh, going to a theater when he was a kid and watching the movie When Worlds Collide, which was a popular science fiction movie at the time. And the, 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 the story line of When Worlds Collide is that the moon is going to crash into the earth and it was going to blow up or disintegrate uh, everything. And so society builds rockets for everybody and they get to travel to a paradise land. But Huffman is astute in pointing out that everybody that got a rocket and that left was white, right? And they got to go to paradise, which left everybody else on earth to disintegrate. Uh, so, you know, that was something that, that that his love of science fiction and then that immediate understanding of the way that science fiction is written and thought of was something that was really informative uh, for him. Um, but one of the things Huffman also talks about is this way that science fiction allows writers, you know, himself and writers to get, have a new way to deal with contemporary issues, right? It, 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 dealing with science fiction, creating worlds, thinking about the future, Right? It, it allows the possibility to create spaces in this politically free way, right? There's a, a, a freedom uh, to imagine things, to imagine the future, you know, to steer the future or to steer another existence, you know, in the way that you want it to be. Um, so it's also worth noting that uh, uh, a lot of critics and writers see some of Huffman's work in relationship with Afro Afrofuturism as well, right? So we're thinking about the work of like Parliament Funkadelic, like Deltron 3030, Cool Keith, the comics of uh, Black Panther, um, Africa Bambata. Um, so in a lot of uh, Afrofuturism, right, we see a link to the past. We see this in Huffman's work. Um, you know, when we see pyramids, right? When we see um, uh, huts with thatched roofs, um, you know, we see this link to the past. We see this acknowledgement of generational trauma. Um, but we also see a future in which Black people exist, right? Which is something that uh, a very basic idea that a lot of white science fiction writers and creators often overlooked uh, when we see those um, uh, worlds being constructed by white writers. There's often no people of color. That's also one of the standout things about uh, Star Trek too, right? Is that they tried to create this cast and this world in which a lot of different species uh, interacted together. So then um, a couple other quick things uh, to note is, uh, you know, um, uh, Huffman also talks about his images being absurd. Um, and so while there are, you know, very charged images, right, contemporary images in his work, right? We see astronauts playing basketball, right? We see water, pyramids of watermelons, um, right? These are very culturally loaded imagery. Um, but the way that he uses them, the way that he puts them together, uh, he wants them to be also read as, as absurd, right? And he wants to acknowledge uh, that absurdity, I think, is a way of acknowledging sort of the absurdity of contemporary life. A lot of artists that embrace imagery and absurdity are, are usually thinking of absurdity as a way of acknowledging the, the, the absurdity of contemporary life, of, of, of the way that things are happening um, uh, uh, in, in the world now. Um, so with all that being said, you know, there, there is specific intention behind this. Like even just looking at the piece, you know, that we're looking at now, right? Um, so this piece being called the Aro, uh, Aroboros, um, uh, which is that snake, right? The snake that's eating itself, um, uh, the symbol of the snake that eats itself. 
uh, right, that, that's often the symbol of a wholeness, right, or infinity. Um, can you guys hear me better? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so there's intention there, right? There's specific intention uh, behind the use of these images, um, but there is space for the viewer to understand or to, uh, to try to understand what's happening here, right? It isn't so prescriptive that there's no room for the viewer to try to understand exactly what it is that we're looking at, right? So we've got this interesting relationship between these astronauts, you know, these, these images that Huffman calls trauma knots. Um, what he's thinking about with these trauma knots are specifically African Americans, you know, being homeless, you know, in, in the United States of America, like constantly tr searching for a place to be, you know, a home to find themselves. So they're constantly out of context, right? Almost looking like they are uh, aliens in a familiar world, trying to understand what it is uh, that they are, are looking at. This little piece, I love this little piece, um, specifically of one of the traumonauts in a, a UFO, you know, again, you know, thinking about either coming to Earth or leaving Earth. And that's, you know, some of the questions that we can see here, right? This is recognizable imagery. Um, and we, and if we see trauma knots playing basketball, if we see trauma knots looking at something that looks familiar in the contemporary United States, it makes us wonder, you know, who are these people in these astronaut suits? Why are they existing and doing these contemporary things? Um, and what is the relationship of those two things? So those, that's the space that I think that, uh, um, that I think Huffman gives the viewer uh, in order to make sense of 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 the imagery that that he's creating so bob if you go back to um the first piece that we were looking at the black and white etching uh remun re remuneration yeah so really quick just thinking about uh, you know how he's leading us in a direction but not specifically telling us what to think right so we've got the title right remuneration, which is this idea of getting paid for a service, right, or to get paid to do something. And then we've got these, these five, I mean, six, if you think about the landscape, really distinct images here. On the left, we've got a, a prison tower, uh, we've got a uh, traffic light, we've got the church's chicken, um, we've got the, um, uh, um, the Price, uh, Birch and Company, uh, which is uh, which were slave dealers, a building that that is a representation of slave dealers, right? And then we've got the traumonauts just sitting and observing all of this, right? So we've got this idea of you know of the summation of the black experience in America, uh, the history of the black experience of America, right? What does this all lead to? Um, you know, what do we, what symbols do we see that represent the black experience in America, right? All of this we can start to read in, right? But it's up to the, the viewer, I think, to find the specific relationships between these. And again, the, the trauma knots, like looking and observing and also trying to make sense of all this, right? So it's familiar to them because we know that they are these African-American explorers, but, but, but observing it like it is unfamiliar to them, right? They're trying to understand what's happening also. So looking at the image, so the image is uh, an etching. And so as Bob explained, um, with an intaglio print and we're using etching, right? We're dealing with, um, we're dealing with a process that, that deals with the difference of a surface. Right, we inc incise lines. With an etching, we're using acid or we're using mordants uh, in metal like copper or like zinc in order to incise lines in that piece of metal. So then we could push ink into those lines, put a specialty piece of printmaking paper uh, over all of that, uh, run it through a press under a high amount of pressure, and then we see you know, the results on the paper. Um, this is all one color, so it's assumed that this would be all one plate. So this is all happening on one piece of metal. Um, and we've got soft ground and we've got spit bite, uh, aquatint. Um, 
So the beauty of a soft ground, and I, and I can't see, you know, I, I did look at this with Bob. We walked through this at a socially distant way uh, with our masks on uh, recently. Um, and I'm looking at an image and I can't remember. Bob, do you see where that soft ground, where the texture would be? Is there an obvious place on, uh, on there? I think that, uh, Joe, this, the soft ground was the, is this drawing Mm -hmm. The way he, I think oh, that okay. kind of putting a sheet of paper mm -hmm. over the surface and, and drawing because it has almost a uh, uh, sort of feeling of a lithograph where it's mm -hmm. kind of lifted the soft ground. Got it. It's, it's not a sharp etched line. It's a softer line. Got and it. And some of this area here. So with a soft ground, so let's go back really quick and talk about doing a, an etching. With, with just a line edge. So when we're doing an etching and we're gonna put a, a plate in a tank of acid, we have to control where the acid cuts and where the acid doesn't cut. And the way that we do that is we put this sort of tar-like substance and we cover the entire surface of a plate with a tar-like substance called hard ground that hardens. And we use a scribe tool and we can draw through that hard ground the metal shows through that hard ground, and then when we put the metal in the acid, the acid knows where to eat away and where not to eat away. So with a soft ground, what we use is we use something like the hard ground, except the soft ground never really dries. And so it always stays tacky. And so the benefit of that is that we can push textures into that soft ground, and it gives us something that isn't as sharp you know, Bob's talking about the kind of sketchiness of like a lithograph showing up in here. So our textures and our lines aren't as sharp as they normally are uh, when we're doing just a line etch. And so one of the ways that artists use this is by putting down a sheet of paper on top of a soft ground um, on a plate. And then we can draw on that sheet of paper and that texture of the sheet of paper transfers that line. So it gives us that fuzzy kind of line quality. And artists like to use that in order to get away from a really precise uh, line that line etching usually gives. So then um, the other thing that we see here um, is spit bite. So spit bite we can see in much of the gray area in the ground and in the sky. And, and so spit bite is a way of creating, you know, Bob re referred earlier to this aqua tint, uh, which gives us these gray tones. Uh, it's the way that we can create tonal transitions in uh, intaglio because mostly in intaglio, when we see um, tones, it's through hatching, cross hatching, or stippling. But the invention of an aqua tint uh, allowed us to start to get uh, gray tones, these sort of continuous gray tones in our plates. And with a spit bite, uh, what we're actually doing is we're actually painting the acid on a plate. So rather than submerging the entire plate and the acid eats the entire plate at once, what we do is we um, uh, dust on some special rosin, right? The rosin acts as a resist uh, to the acid. And so we dust rosin on the entire plate. And then we actually take a paintbrush and we load it with a combination of acid and some kind of binder. In the WVU press, what I use is I use nitric acid and gum arabic as a binder. And then I can paint the acid right on the plate. And what that gives us is the ability to, you know, pinpoint what it is we want to etch, but also it gives us this sort of like aqueous sort of painterly effect. And so you can really see that in the ground where there's these dots of darker areas. You can see a little bit of more of a painterly look in the lower half of the ground. And in the sky, we get a sense of sort of the brush stroke uh, of the aqua tint uh, up top. So it allows us again, just like the soft ground, to give us marks that aren't really specifically thought of uh, stereotypically as etching sort of mark making. Joe, can I move over to the other print to show that a little? Better? Totally. Yep. Okay. Yes, and so in the sky, you could really get a sense of that aqua tint, right? That blue sky, and you get that sense of that splatter. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is the way that we can get, you know, intaglio prints away from the sort of like strict 
linear graphic quality that for you know the first hundred 150 years or so of intaglio printmaking that is what you know every artist was uh, really limited to and then here we see multiple colors and with a lot of printmaking when we've got multiple colors we're dealing with multiple plates um, artists have to register their imagery on these multiple plates so that when we print them you know everything lines up perfectly so it adds a level of complexity to the process once we start adding colors we start adding time and opportunities for our print to, to mess up as well you know um, I think another thing before we go on to the other the large one with with the peace sign um, I think the other thing to say about this is that um, you know Bob referred to this in the beginning of this idea that you know a lot of artists come into master print shops not really knowing exactly what to expect and that's part of what a lot of master printers are really excited by working with an artist who doesn't really know a lot about printmaking and researching um, uh, David Huffman for this talk one of the things I wasn't aware of was his painting and his drawing with stamps. He actually created a few stamps of basketballs uh, and he created a series of paintings and drawings much like this where he was just stamping individual basketballs. So he had this comfort that he didn't even realize, I don't think, at, at first with ideas of print that were already existing in his work. And he talks about the fact that once he got in and started working with the master printers, he was really comfortable. He found a, a really quick comfort with the process of printmaking. All right, so then, yeah, let's move on to the big, the big piece, which is really just an absolutely beautiful piece. You know, so here, you know, we've got this combination again of, you know, these sort of absurd representations of contemporary life uh, life all around the, the globe, really, um, of black life in America. So we've got this, the, the, the hatched, uh, thatched um, uh, roof uh, hut at the top. Uh, at the left, we move down and it's actually Jackson Pollock's studio. So there's this interesting relationship to art history that's happening there. The Bluebird Liquors is the liquor store that David Huffman uh, frequents. <laughs> it's on the corner of his neighborhood. And one thing he talks about is how the Bluebird liquor store itself has stayed, even though the owners have changed over time. His relationship with basketball is a personal relationship with basketball. Uh, every time he was a kid and he needed to vent, right, get some steam out, just get away, he would play basketball. But he also acknowledges the sort of cultural uh, relationship of, you know, the, the again, the Black experience and the pressure in a way of, of thinking about basketball um, in, in, the, in that community, right? And then you've got this peace sign, you've got these elephants, um, you know, the elephant being this sort of like, you know, standard uh, representation of the safari um, of, of, again, this African experience or, the, or this stereotypical idea of, of what Africa represents. Um, this weird kind of blue green thing, you know, which, he doesn't really cue in too much in the interviews I've read about what that is. It almost looks like something like playground equipment. Uh, and then the Afronauts, right, in multiple places, or the uh, Traumanauts in multiple places in there, um, in a boat. Uh, and then, you know, the one at the bottom, you know, looking like maybe he's calling out to them, cautioning them. It looks like maybe the boat ran into the tree. Um, so the relationship between the, the trauma nuts there, I don't think is a, an immediately understood relationship. And then the environment, the nature, which Huffman talks about as being very inviting uh, for the viewer, like wanting to use nature in his work as a way to invite the viewer into the work and starting to examine what's happening here. We see the same sorts of things here. You know, Bob can clearly point to the places where we see spit bite, anywhere where you see what looks like these sort of drip areas, right? We've got that same, you know, spit bite. Um, sugar lift is in here. Sugar lift is a little bit, uh, might be a little bit harder to exactly see. Uh, anywhere where we see this dense color that could be a sugar lift. Sugar lift is a way, another way of creating another tone uh, in the plate. 
what we do is we paint a water soluble substance on the plate and then we cover that uh, when we paint it on we let it dry we cover it with the tar with the hard ground and then we pour steaming hot water on top and that hot water penetrates the hard ground and it gets to the sugar lift and it dissolves the sugar lift so it opens up areas uh, which we can then um, put an aqua tint on and etch um, let's see sugar lift soft there's soft ground in there which you know, the line work might be soft ground too, if, if Bob, you can tell if, if yes, it's similar if, in the line quality. It's, it's the same thing with the elephant here. It almost looks uh, lithographic in nature, the way it was drawn, these trees yeah. Yeah. that have a softer edge to them. I had a question from a participant about um, the, actually that kind of bright yellow tree in the upper right corner mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how uh, they mentioned that it almost looked like it was collaged on. If you had any ideas about what that technique was or could talk about that. Bob, does it that look may like it was printed? That may in fact be the uh, sugar lift mm -hmm. because it's definitely printed, mm -hmm. but it's, it has a, like a, a harder edge around it. Mm -hmm. Like it, it Oh, might I gotcha. Uh, mm -hmm. And so painting it, that specific shape with the sugar lift would keep it that specific shape. Yeah. Yep. And so the other thing about keeping those colors that pure, this is the reason why, and especially in Intaglio, we need to print um, these different colors with different plates, because we can have a yellow plate in which we only ink up that ink color. Uh, we're leaving areas in the, what's known as the key image, which is this dominantly um, graphite or black plate we can leave areas in that plate where there's no imagery um, so that uh, that bright color can really stand out. Um, the other thing about that is in the details of the way that this print is made, it does talk about this print having black light sensitive areas. And so I'm wondering if that tree and the yellow in the middle of the composition and the yellow by the trauma knot down in the left of the composition are printed in a black light sensitive ink as well, which would give it that little bit of a luminosity, even when we're not looking at it under a black light. Um, uh, it has that, that's, that, that kind of, of uh, look to it as well. Um, so yeah, so, you know, technically complicated, right? All of these kinds of things coming together, you know, my assumption is I see, you know, the black light or the yellow, you have the key layer, you've got the red, you've got the blue and the green, the brown of Jackson Pollock's um, studio. You know, there might be five plates in printing uh, with this. Um, and, you know, it may take running a five plate intaglio print, it might take 45 minutes to an hour to print one print in the edition. And this is an edition of 35. Uh, and those 35 in the edition are the ones that met the standards of the edition. Uh, even master printers, you talk to any master printer, and if you've got five plates, there's plenty of opportunities for a plate to move when it goes through the press, for you to not wipe one of those plates just the right way, uh, and you spend an hour running one of these prints, and it comes out, and you take a look at it, and you put it against the... Uh, the, the one print that is the standard bearer of the quality of the image and it doesn't match up and that's not going to go in the edition, right? So there's an hour of work that just went down the tubes because of, you know, some little mishap. Um, and so it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to create uh, all of these prints, but especially a print like this uh, and to this scale. This is also for intaglio printmaking. This is a very ambitious scale uh, in terms of the size of the plates and not just the amount of plates as well. So I'm going to kind of jump in right now because we have about five or six minutes left and mm -hmm. um, I'm going to open up for questions. Um, we already have a, a one in the queue, but also if anyone else has a question um, for 
Joe or Bob will kind of start that. Um, I really appreciate your insight into David Huffman's work, Joe, and mm -hmm. into the process of printmaking. Um, I think as someone who works in the galleries a lot, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding, I think, in a world where a lot of people press print on their computers frequently. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate <laughs> you going through that with us. Um, so uh, George would like to know, uh, if the same scene can be produced in paint, watercolor, or print, why would you choose the print technique, mm -hmm. especially after the laborious process you just described? Yes. And that is a that is a fantastic question, right? And that is the question you get a lot of times in thinking about print. And so there's a couple ways. I'll try to answer this question quickly to allow others, but there's a couple ways to think about this. So first is like David Huffman's relationship with the printer, right? And so, you know, David Huffman is coming into this as an established artist, as an installation, sculptural, painting artist. Um, and thinking about an opportunity to make something new, right? As artists, uh, I think a, a, a lot of times we're looking for an opportunity to be challenged. We're looking for opportunities to use new tools, to make new work. Um, and so when an artist is coming into a print shop in, in this kind of way, it offers an opportunity to think, make imagery in, with layers and with colors, you know, in strategies that you haven't thought about before or haven't used before. So it, it really opens up possibilities. And I think for a lot of artists, the hope is that they experience something like this, trying these new things, learning these new materials, thinking about making imagery in new ways. And hopefully that comes back to their regular practice, right? Um, and it offers opportunities for them to be impacted and changed when they go back to their, their own studios and continue to work. The other, and, and so the other thing to say about that is um, th there's also a financial, right? So getting into the realities of the art world, there's also a financial reason why you would want to do this as an artist um, and as a press, right? So you can make one painting and you, maybe you, you uh, attempt to, or maybe you do sell that painting for twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Um, and it goes to that one person, and then that's it for that image, right? When you're creating prints, you're making multiples, right? The price point on a print is a lot less, right? A well-known artist like Huffman, like this print, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm just gonna guess, maybe cost 1,500, 2,000, you know, maybe $3,000. So the price point is a lot better for collectors. There's 35 of these that can go out to 35 different collectors and museums. Um, and the other thing is that a lot of times when artists are doing this, they're not just replicating prints. They might be using the same um, uh, imagery. You know, Bob and I had a really good discussion about this the other day where, you know, he was talking about this idea that, you know, you're not just replicating imagery when you're, when you're uh, working with a master printer. Um, you're, you know, maybe using some of the same ideas and images, but you're, you're making new work, right? Again, hoping that an audience can be able to see all of this. You know, this whole exhibition, if it was all painting, you know, probably doesn't exist, right, to be honest. Um, but because they're prints, because they're smaller, their work's on paper, they're easier to ship, right? It makes all of this a little bit uh, uh, easier to do. And that's one of the benefits of, of making prints. Thank you, Joe. Does anybody else have any questions? I know it's a little hard to do it instantaneously when you have to type it. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has, I'll, give, I'll, I'll let the chat box uh, sit for, um, Q&A box sit for a moment or so just to see if we have a final question or two for Bob or Joe. But while I wait for that, I do want to point out um, both Bob and Joe emphasize the really um, skillful role of that a master printer takes in this uh, um, in this process and one thing I just wanted to give a little plug for is our next edition of this lunchtime look series is going to take place on October 2nd at 12 noon and uh, we just put the registration live on our website and it is going to be with Pam Paulson so when you hear Joe and Bob talking about Pam and the work that she does in interaction with these artists, 
we're actually going to get to hear that from her firsthand and she's going to zoom to us from her studio which is a real privilege um, we're hoping actually they might be working on some more of the G's Bend editions uh, so if you're interested in kind of understanding a little bit more about this process I know for me seeing it really helps um, as I try and wrap my brain around how to how this works and how to explain it to others. So um, we would encourage you to register for that. Um, I think that I have spoken long enough that if anyone had a burning question, they had to <laughs> type it into the Q&A box. So uh, since it's right at one, we'll be respectful of everyone's time and thank you all for joining us. Please um, follow our uh, webpage and social media and mailings for more information about more programs. As I said, there's Bob, thanks for coming back into the picture. Um, as I said, one of the things that this affords us is the opportunity to talk to some of our friends who are further afield. So we're really happy to have Pam and um, hopefully some other exciting artists. We have um, uh, an upcoming uh, talk as well. Um, uh, by Becky Senf uh, on Angela Adams. So please look at our website and uh, we will hope to see all of you again in the virtual world soon and in our galleries whenever you feel you're able, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 1230 to six. Thank you to Bob, thank you to Joe. Please come in. Wishing you all well. Yeah, please come into the gallery and see this exhibition in person if you can. Mm -hmm.